nothing but blessed to be surrounded by such a loving circle of friends and family. Thanks again, Linda Walker Ishii. And then one more from the same family. It says, a thank you to let you know how very much your thoughtfulness meant. It says, thank you so much for feeding our family after Patty's funeral and for all you have done over the years for her and my brother Jimmy. I pray God will continue to bless your church so that you can reach people for his kingdom. Uh, sincerely, I believe it's Kay Vince. I had a hard time reading the end of it. Uh, but anyway, just wanted to share those two thank you letters uh, this morning. Uh, announcements. Discipleship training will resume on October the 2nd. Um, not, no adult choir this afternoon. No adult choir this afternoon uh, due to the Deacon Ordination Council that will take place at 4. Uh, there will be a Deacon Ordination Council at 4 with a service uh, following at 6. Uh, but we will have children's choir practice at 4.15. 5.15. Because no, no discipleship training, that's correct. Uh, children's Choir will meet at 515 uh, because there's no discipleship training. So they will meet and practice a Christmas program. Uh, softball tournament, it is coming up very quickly. Uh, it's two weeks from yesterday. Uh, the deadline to sign up, uh, if you want to be a part, is this next Monday. Not tomorrow, but the next Monday. So if you'd like to be a part um, and play, we would love to have you. But also, if you'd like to umpire or just come and, and visit and, and watch, we would love to have you in that as well. So hoping for a good crowd. Uh, you can see several other announcements. The youth will be going to Goodwater this Wednesday. Uh, trunk or Treat has been set for Sunday, October the 30th. Uh, there's recommendations. There's also a renewal service coming up association-wide. Several, several things going on. Before we go any further, is there anything you would like to add? Senior adult revival starting tomorrow. Tomorrow. First Baptist Menin Hall and then I think uh, Kennedy Springs and then First Baptist McGee. So it would be Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday. And I do believe they have a great lineup uh, uh, going to be there. Uh, anything else? All right, if not, our Sunday school today was 131. Last week, 137. Today's offering is $1,471. Let's pray together. Father God, we love you and thank you for the opportunity to gather this morning, praying that uh, you're just lifted up during our time of worship, Father God, that we uh, clear all the distractions out of our hearts and minds, and we just focus totally on you, Father God, and we pray that uh, everything that's said and done this morning would bring honor and glory to your name, and it's in your name we pray, amen. Thank you, Brother Jason. 633 would be our fellowship song, I Will Sing the Wondrous Story. We will sing the first, second of stanzas, and then we'll fellowship, and then we'll sing the fourth stanza. Please stand as we sing. 633. I will sing the wondrous story of the Christ who died for me. Come on. 
to Matthew's Gospel, chapter 6, read a, uh, a very, I think, reminiscent text that most of us know, and I think it connects really with prayer so, so very well, and it's Matthew chapter 6, read verses 25 and following. Now again, this is, this is Jesus speaking, this is all a part of the Sermon on the Mount, which we will get back into next week after we finish uh, the seven letters to the church of the revelation and here's what jesus says to us now he said he starts off by saying therefore which is important because that means what he's about to say connects to what he has just said and what he has just said is talking about not laying up treasures in heaven now he says therefore i tell you do not be anxious about your life what will you eat or what you will drink nor about your body what you will put on is not life more than food and the body more than clothing? Look at the birds of the air. They neither sow nor reap nor gather into barns, and yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not of more value than they? And which of you, by being anxious, can add a single hour to a span of life? And why are you anxious about clothing? Consider the lilies of the field, how they grow. They neither toil nor spin. Yet I tell you, even Solomon in all his glory was not arrayed like one of these. But if God so clothes the grass of the field, which today is alive and tomorrow is thrown into the oven, will he not much more clothe you, O you of little faith? Therefore do not be anxious, saying, What shall we eat, or what shall we drink, or what shall we wear? For the Gentiles seek after all these, and your heavenly Father knows that you need them all. And then he says, verse 33, But seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things will be added to you. Therefore, do not be anxious about tomorrow, for tomorrow will be anxious for itself. Sufficient for the day is its own trouble. I think when we think about what Jesus is trying to say here, he's reminding us that he's still in control of everything, and he takes care of us, even when it looks like on our perspective that he's not, right? Uh, just this week, we've, uh, we've seen a couple of high school students die, and we, we've seen one of our own out of nowhere go from having headaches to having a, a, a tumor of some sort on the brain. Sufficient for today is its own trouble, right? Some of us are going to have doctor's appointments this, this week and surgeries and there's financial things. There's all of these different things that we all have to struggle with because we're all alive and we all have to deal with whatever life throws at us. But Jesus says sufficient for today is its own trouble. And what he's reminding us of is this, is that worry doesn't help anything. Instead, we need to trust the Lord. And so when we think about prayer, I mean, prayer is us admitting to God, hopefully, that we are not in control of anything and we need his help. That's really what prayer is. And if we're ever at a point where we think we don't need his help, prayers really aren't going to be answered anyway. Right? So I think what Jesus is really wanting us to to, to to focus on before we pray is just understanding that real life is difficult but he's sufficient and good to get us through it so let's just be mindful of that this morning before before we pray uh, that God really wants to answer our prayers God really does answer them even before we even pray them and he has been sufficiently good all the way up until now hadn't he we, we talked about that last week God has been good up till now 
meaning that he's always good. So let's just be mindful of that. Would you play something for us a little bit, Mr. Dort? I'm going to offer the altar up again. If anybody wants to come down to pray, um, you can make an altar where you are. But I know we all have different needs of various kinds. So wherever you are, wherever you're sitting, um, let's go to the Lord in prayer. remember that we're not supposed to be anxious about our life about what we have what we need what we think we need God but instead we should look to you God we submit ourselves to you knowing that anxiousness and um, does not prepare us for tomorrow but we need to be mindful that you're in control of today and God we pray for all of our brothers and sisters in this room and even in our own community that are dealing with so many different things God how how some life have just been um, just lost even this week and some are really concerned about uh, health issues God and, and we submit that those are really serious issues that, that we we don't want to gloss over but God we pray that all of us will be able to put our faith and trust in you God that we'll seek your kingdom first we'll seek your righteousness first God by, and knowing that when we do that God all the things that we need are going to be added to us God we pray that we won't be anxious about tomorrow God instead we'd have faith in today God, be with our brothers and sisters in our own room that have so many different needs, God. And I just pray that you would answer them and supply those needs that only, in a way that only you can. God, we love you. God, we thank you for Jesus and who he is and all the beautiful and wonderful things he's done for us, God. And we just pray that we would always be able to see those. And it's in his name that we pray and ask these things. Amen. Let's sing Satisfied with Jesus, number 622. Please stand up and tell us that good doctor's report we got this week.
Give God a hand for that. Thank you so much. And I'm going to warn you, Brother White, he told me last Sunday, he's feeling the urge to preach. Okay, that's right. So you've been working on it, Brother, one of them short ones, okay? Okay. <laughs> Trust and obey, number 500. This will be off toward. Will you stand as we sing?
Chris Mona didn't have a video. As you know, we have been, we've set our goal for $1,500 for Margaret Lackey, and I've got to help her this morning. How many of you, when you went to college, went to Baptist Student Union, BSU? How many of you um, went to BSU in Mississippi? All right, guess what? This is how you support that great ministry, right? This is one of the great ways uh, that Margaret Lackey Missions Offering goes to help our state, Baptist Student Union. It's not 100% funded through Margaret Lackey, um, but uh, a lot of it does help. So we're going we're gonna to show you where our goal is right now, okay? And so she's going to do it real slow for dramatic effect. So you keep moving it up, and I'll tell you to stop, okay? Slower. No, I'm just kidding. Go ahead. All right, keep going. Keep going. Keep going. You keep going a little bit more. A little bit more. Keep going. Keep going. All right, we can't go any further up. So I wanted to make sure we did this after the offering. All right, we've already hit our goal. All right, uh, as of right now, we had $1,642 given. All right, thank you for your generosity. Thank you. Now, just because we hit our goal doesn't mean you don't, if you, if you already, you know, put it in your heart to give, don't not give because we hit our goal, all right? Uh, 100% of this goes to Mississippi Mission, so uh, thank you so much for your generosity, and we want to continue to, to be a, a church that's faithful to give to missions, and this is, this is Mississippi work right here, so you, you can, you could do a whole lot worse with that. Thank you. Wonderful report. The choir would like to sing this time, it is no secret what God can do.
if God's done something good for you, say amen. amen. I, th I think the, uh, the po one of the points of that song, the only way it's a secret what God can do is if we don't tell people. You know, so if one of the points of, I, th I think, I think Scripture backs this up. Sometimes the reason God answers prayers in such, such an amazing way is so that we can take those answered prayers and tell people what he's done because it's about, it's about him and, and his glory. Well, we finally get to arguably the most known about church of the seven letters or the seven churches in the book of Revelation, the one where people know a couple of texts about it, uh, one we, we deal with, and one I think sometimes we kind of twist a little, little incorrectly. We'll get to that in a second, but we're going to be in Revelation chapter 3, starting in verse 14. Now, anybody that knows me knows me well, anyway, knows that I really like good coffee, okay? Uh, I, when we lived in Carthage, there was no good coffee in Carthage. You couldn't buy it in the stores, and uh, there certainly wasn't any place you could go get a good cup. So I started even roasting my own beans, all right? Uh, there's a, actually one of the biggest green uh, bean, okay, not green beans, right? But the coffee before it's roasted is green. One of the biggest companies in all of North America that sells green beans is actually in Goodman, Mississippi, believe it or not. Okay. Yeah, a guy from Mississippi married into a family from Hawaii. He, they gave it to him. He moved it all the way to Goodman. And one time we even went up just to, just to, to tour the place. But I love really good coffee. I had a, had a friend uh, uh, named, uh, named Bill. Uh, Bill Buckley used to be the, he played football at Mississippi State. If y'all remember Bill, Bill's a great man. He used to be the state director of the Fellowship of Christian Athletes. He told me one time, he said, Adam, we live in America. There's no reason to drink bad coffee. And I said, I agree with you. So even when we travel, I always try to find good coffee shops to, uh, 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 to, to find some good coffee. Well, a few years ago, I realized uh, that I slowly started changing my taste a little bit, and so I started drinking something called cold-brewed coffee. Anyone ever had cold-brewed? Not, not iced coffee, but cold-brewed coffee. Now, cold-brewed coffee is a little different. Regular coffee is made with hot water. Cold-brewed coffee is not made with hot water. Okay, And because it's not made with hot water, you have to steep it very much like you would do a tea. Now, then after it's made, then you put it in the fridge, and then you drink it cold. But because of the way it's made, it actually has a ton more caffeine in it, which is really the reason I like it. So the, the different things is about it is this. So I love good, freshly made coffee, and I love cold-brewed coffee that's served cold. But you know one thing I don't like is lukewarm coffee. It's just gross. There's certain coffee that's made hot and it's made to drink hot. There's some coffee that's made cold and it's meant to drink cold, but there's no coffee out there that's made lukewarm meant to drink lukewarm. It's just, it would be kind of gross to me anyway, right? Uh, but the, the issue that, that we see here in Revelation in chapter 3, we see Arguably, again, one of the most famous of the seven churches, the church at Laodicea, it's this church that Jesus condemns, not because it's cold, but because it's lukewarm. It's right in this middle stage. And my hope this morning is, is as we finish the look at the seven churches, that we'll look at this church with fresh eyes, because we've heard sermons from this, from this section. We've, we've used it multiple times. We use it as a metaphor. We, we talk about being hot and cold all the time. We use that uh, 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 as a way to, to, to discuss or maybe even to, uh, to demonstrate what it is we believe about Jesus or maybe where we are in, in our spirit. But if we were to title this church, this church really is the nauseating church. It's the nauseating church. It's this church that, according to the original language, really doesn't, when it says Jesus wants to spit or to spew out of his mouth, this church, because they're lukewarm, what it means is, is that he wants, the real word there is vomit. It's the only time this word's used in the New Testament. It, it's, a, it's, a, it's a super descriptive term, and I, my hope is, is that we don't let our familiarity with this section Keep us from maybe getting what God might would have for all of us. That's my hope this morning. So let's pray 
and then let's read and let's hopefully see what God would have for us this morning. Lord, thank you again. You're so good, God. God, as, that, as our choir just beautifully sang, there, it is no secret what you can do. But God, I do think that sometimes we're not as faithful to tell people about how good you are as we should be. And God, I pray that you convict us of that, God. I pray that we'd be obedient to do what you called us to do, that we'd do it the right way. God, that we'd, we'd see your goodness and we'd see your love and your grace and your mercy and that we would be forever changed because of it, God. And it's in your beautiful name we ask these things. Amen. Start off with verse, verse 14. It says, And to the angel of the church in Laodicea write, The words of the Amen, the faithful and true witness, the beginning of God's creation. Again, this letter, just like the others, they come, and Jesus gives a depiction of himself. And this is very, very important for us to look at uh, the depiction here. And so, so first, Laodicea was the city that was south of Philadelphia. Right? We looked at Philadelphia last week. It was wealthy. It was influential. Um, it was a flourishing commercial city. It was home to uh, manufacturing of woolen garments that were known for uh, a type of, of sheep that was there that, that was black, that had this beautiful tone to it. And because of that, it was, it was extremely valuable. It was also a, a great and important center, center of banking, right? There was a big bank that was there that, was, that had lots of money within it, obviously, and people would come from all around to, to get money, to get loans, to do banking there. It was the center of the worship of a Greek god called Asclepius, who was known as the god of healing. We'll get to that in a second. And because of that, it was also known uh, as a famous center of the ancient world uh, for its ophthalmology, or treatment of the eyes, right? We'll get to that here in a second. The city was just like all the other cities of these seven cities. It was important. There were people that were there. There were people that needed the gospel. There was a church that was within it. But because of a variety of things, this church that's in this important city that needs the gospel is failing to be effective in sharing the gospel with the city. So again, Jesus, he comes and he gives us a visible description of who he is. And who is he? He's the amen, it says. He's the faithful and true witness. He's the beginning of God's creation, it says. So what do these descriptions mean? Well, we say amen, some of you. You, you, you say it in the sermon. Or sometimes when you hear a good word or after beautiful uh, 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 singing from our choir or just hymns that we're singing ourselves, we say it all the time. What do we mean when we say it or when you say it? Have you ever thought about that? It's some sort, in our heart, we know it means some sort of agreement is what it means. Really, it means so be it is the idea. Or let it be as you just said, something to that effect. And here, Jesus being called the amen, the singular amen. What it means is this, is that Jesus Christ himself is the guarantee. He is the, the confirmation. He's uh, the center of all of God's promises. Jesus is the amen. That all of the promises that we have, that we celebrate, that we cherish, that we, that we want to know, that we want to know sometimes more deeply. Jesus is the source. He is the supreme source of all of God's promises and his plans. And let us be thankful that that is the way it is. That Jesus is the faithful and true witness is also important. He's faithful. Here, faithful, when it's applied to Jesus, it means that he is reliable. That all those promises that the Bible tells us, that he is the amen, he is the source of that, because he's faithful, that means he can be trusted. Folks, you need to know this morning that you can trust the Lord. You can't trust anything else in your world. Family will let you down. Church will let you down. A 401K will let you down. Government will let you down. Our health will finances, you name it. Everything has the ability to let you down. But Jesus himself, he is faithful and he can be trusted. Not only is he faithful, he also says he's the faithful and true witness. Well, true really refers to Jesus' own testimony about himself. Folks, do you know that everything that Jesus said was true? 
that everything in Scripture is true? If it's not true, Jesus can't be trusted. But because he is trustworthy and he's true, he can be trusted and so can Scripture. So no matter what it is we deal with in our own lives, we can trust the Lord because his words to us are true. He is faithful. He is true. So the fact that Jesus is a faithful and true witness means that Jesus is the one who reveals God to us faithfully. If you want to know who God is, you look at Jesus. If you want to know what God wants for you, we look to Jesus. If we want to be faithful, we we look to Jesus. Jesus is the faithful and true witness. And because of that, again, let us be thankful. But then it says, Jesus says, he's the beginning of God's creation. We've got to be real careful with this. I want to be a little bit more critical in this. Let's not just, let's look a little deeper here. This does not mean that Jesus was created because Jesus is eternal. Go all the way back to Genesis, Jesus is there. This does not mean that Jesus was created. In fact, if you go to, go to John 1, Genesis 1, we understand God, Jesus is eternal. No, Jesus was not created. The meaning here is that Jesus Christ himself is the one in which all things are created. It says in Colossians 3, For by him all things were created, in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities, all things were created through him and for him. And he is before all things, and in him all things hold together. And he is the head of the body of the church. He's the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, and in every, that in him everything he might be a preeminent. Jesus was not made. He's eternal. He was begotten when he came to earth, when he left eternity to come here. So Jesus is the source of all God's promises. Jesus is the true witness about the message of God himself. And he's the beginning and the source of all things. And we need to be reminded of that this morning, that Jesus really is the beginning of everything. He's the source of every promise that we need in our life. Are you dealing with health issues? You need to understand Jesus is a great healer. You got relationship issues? You need to understand Jesus is the first and the last. He's trustworthy. No matter what it is that we are going through, Jesus is the source of everything good. And because of that, we need to be thankful. Let's look at verse 15. I know your works. You are neither cold nor hot. Would that you were either cold or hot. So because you were lukewarm and neither hot nor cold, I will spit you out of my mouth. Again, in every one of the letters to the church, Jesus reminds them, he reminds us that Jesus knows our works. He knows what we go through. He knows what we're dealing with. He knows how we are faithful. He knows where we are not faithful. At. Like Jesus knows our works works he sees everything that happens in the entire universe but he sees who we are and what we do even inside the church and even inside parts of our soul that we don't even know about Jesus knows but here the works that Jesus sees for this church are a little different he says they're neither hot nor are they cold instead they're lukewarm Now, many of us have heard this section. Many of us know this section. You've heard sermons on this section. We can, some of us can probably, you know, quote some of this by heart. And indeed, we we need to be clear here that being hot really does mean what we think it means. It means that we're being faithful to Jesus. That who we are radiates who Jesus is. That Jesus for us is a real relationship that causes us to be faithful to him. That's what it means to be, to be hot. This is good. This is right. And to be honest, this is absolutely normal. And to be even further honest, it's the bare minimum of what a Christian is supposed to look like. All 
Christians are supposed to be hot. All of us. This is a non-negotiable thing, according to Jesus. We should all be hot in this regard. But to be cold here does not mean, I think, what often we have heard it to mean. We've often heard that either you're a hot Christian or you are a cold Christian, right? That, that sometimes we drift off into being cold. And folks, I just want to be honest, that's just simply not so. It's not. A Christian, by definition, cannot be cold to Jesus. You just can't. It does not work that way. For to be a cold Christian would mean that we can exist as unfaithful Christians, and that is antithetical to the gospel message. We can't be a, 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 an A-team Christian or a junior varsity Christian. Right? Like, we can't be like, well, those guys are the starters, but I'm going to be, I'm cool. I'm just glad I got on the uniform, and I'm just going to sit over there. That's not what we see in Scripture. We're either faithful to Jesus or we're cold. And being cold here does not mean being a cold Christian. Because Jesus says, I would rather you be cold. Think about it. Do you think Jesus really wants us to be Christians that don't love Jesus? No. That, that goes against all of Scripture. What Jesus is saying is this. You should be hot or you should be lost. That's your options. They're in the middle. And that's a dangerous place for us to be. Because when you're lost... You have an excuse until that day you meet Jesus. But if you're saved, you have no excuse not to be faithful to Jesus. So to be hot or cold, it doesn't mean we can just be sort of Christians and half-hearted Christians and we can just be sort of, sort of. No, that's not what that's saying. Jesus says you should be hot, but you're not. You're over here in the middle. And I want to vomit you, lukewarm people, out of my mouth, not the cold or the hot. Jesus is not going to vomit the cold people out of his mouth. He's going to give them opportunities to repent and put their faith and trust into Christ. But there will be that moment where those opportunities stop. But for the rest of us, if we are in him, we cannot exist as lukewarm Christians. Because there will also be a day where Jesus says, I'm done with you. That's what he means here by vomit. 2 Peter 2.21 puts it this way, For it would have been better for them never to have known the way of righteousness than after knowing it to turn back from the holy commandment delivered to them. Peter says that, 2 Peter 2.21. It would be better for us to have never heard the gospel and be lost in our sin than to know the gospel and respond to the gospel and then live as if it doesn't matter. That's what Jesus is saying to the church here. There's something else I think at play, just from a historical perspective, I want you to think about living in the city during this time. Laodicea, Laodicea was near two other cities. One was Hierapolis. And Hierapolis was known for hot waters that were inherent to the nature that were used quite often in medical treatments. You know, like hot springs, if you will. Anybody ever been to a hot spring? It's supposed to be really good for, for, your, for your health. I don't, I've never been, but, uh, but I've, I've heard that that is a true thing. Another city was Colossae, which is where we get the book of Colossians. It had very cold, pure, and refreshing water. So here's Laodicea, wonderful, rich, all of these good things, but it didn't have access to its own water. No matter how much money was in the bank, they couldn't provide bare necessity of water. So the water was piped in through aqueduct, or into an aqueduct from four or five miles away. And so by the time it got into the aqueduct, no matter where they got it from, it was neither hot nor was it cold. It sat in the aqueduct as lukewarm water. 
And it's clear that these people would have seen this as an illustration. It was lukewarm. It was tepid. It, was, it had little value in contrast to their neighbors where it was hot or it was cold. So here's this rich, important city, and they can't even get water. Y'all remember a few weeks ago when Jackson couldn't get water? That was, a, that, was a, that was just a recipe for disaster, wasn't it? Can you imagine literally not having clean or water or access to clean water? This city knows exactly what it was like. So what does Jesus want to do with this tepid, this lukewarm church? He says he wants to spit them out. Again, literally, this word is vomit. That's the word. That we make God at times by living the way we do sick. The sovereign Lord of the universe who has no physical need whatsoever, does not sleep, does not slumber, here is saying, I'm nauseated at times. This is a frightening word for every one of us this morning. Isn't it? I mean, when we think about wanting to please the Lord and how we live, and we think about wanting to be obedient, and, and every one of us wants to meet Jesus and say, "Good, enter in, my good and faithful servant. Every one of us wants to hear those good words. And here's Jesus saying, I'm going to vomit you out of my mouth. That's a sharp, condemning word that ought to frighten us all a little bit. It is. It's frightening. Jesus is telling them and us, that the glorified Jesus Christ himself does not tolerate lukewarm believers. Be hot or be cold or be nothing. Be this or this, but this, this place in the middle that we think we're cool with, this place in the middle that, that we feel like if we'll just show up every now and then come to church, we give every so often, we, we may serve, we may not, then we're going to be good. Jesus is like, no, that's not how it works. They're like salt that's lost its saltiness, which according to Matthew 5, 13, will be thrown out because it's useless. Again, this is a strong work of judgment and condemnation. And it serves, I hope, as a strong warning to every one of us here this morning. What does Jesus look at us and say? Take it more personally. What does Jesus look at you and say? Does, is he looking at us and saying, well done, good and faithful servant. I see your works. Or is he saying, I see how you treat people. And you're lukewarm. Or he's saying, I, I see what you're doing when no one's looking. You're lukewarm. I, I see what you're doing late at night. I see how you're treating your family or your friends. Or I see how you're not giving. Or I see how you're this or that. Just fill in the blank. Every one of us can have some sort of a blank field on our own hearts. And Jesus looks at us and I think we need to say, well, what does Jesus say about us? We cannot fall for this lie, this Americanized lie, that if we can just show up every now and then and Jesus is satisfied with us, that's not biblical. He wants more for us. He wants more for you. Jesus is not okay with us being disobedient. He's not. He's not okay with us just halfway doing life. And folks, there's going to come a day for every one of us where we're going to have to answer. And it's coming sooner for some of us because none of us know what's going to happen tomorrow. We must be hot, not lukewarm. Then he says in verse 17, for, for you say, I'm rich, I prospered, I need nothing, not realizing that you are wretched, pitiable, poor, blind, and naked. Folks, every person that thinks they're okay, never sees the fact that they're wretched, pitiable, poor, blind, and naked. When we ever get to the point where we think we have arrived, we realize we're actually lost out in the wilderness. Again, this city here is so wealthy. They're known for having so much money. In AD 60, the whole city was destroyed by an earthquake. Rome wanted to come in and give them money. They said, no, nah, we're good. We got it. We don't need any help. We got all this money in the bank. We're just going to open it up. We'll be fine. So this city and this church was incredibly wealthy by the world's standards. And folks, our church is wealthy by the world's standards. 
We're sitting on $1.1 plus million dollars in the bank. God has blessed us tremendously. But that ain't going to save us. And that's not going to make us obedient in the future. And that's not going to help us reach people for the gospel if we don't do what the gospel tells us to do on, the, on our personal side of things. This church stands in contrast to the church at Smyrna. If you remember the church at Smyrna, they were poor by the world standards, but were rich according to Jesus. And here Laodicea is rich by the world standards and poor in the eyes of Jesus. And generally, we're, we swing between two different options. So what does Jesus say? First, he says they're rich. They say this about themselves. We're rich. The church supposed it had enough money that they no longer needed the Lord's help. The congregation was kind of like the city, proud of its banking, proud of its affluence, boasting that they had enough wealth and they don't need anything. And then Jesus says, no, you're actually poor. You think you're wealthy, you're poor. Second, the church thought it was clothed. And what that means there is like, we've got on these clothes of righteousness because we're good. And Jesus says, no, you're naked. Or as mama said when I was a kid, you're naked. You're, you're, you're running around naked, and little babies run around like that because they don't know that they're, they're naked, right? That's the picture. They're clueless to running around in the, in the way that they actually are because they think they're clothed. And then he says they're wretched, pitiable. And then he says they're blind. Now, again, I told you in the introduction, the Odyssey was known in the ancient world for this center of ophthalmology. People would come from all around to get treated when they couldn't see, when they had eye issues. And here Jesus says, no, nah, you're blind. You can have all the best medical care you can have, but you got nothing. But even sadder than them being poor and then being naked and then being blind. You know what the worst part about this is? They don't even know it. That's the condemnation. I want you to think about this just for a second. That every one of us is a sinful person that's wretched, pitiable, blind, and naked. And without the grace of God in all of our life, we're lost. And every one of us will go to an eternal hell forever. Jesus is the amen. He is the first and the last. He is the beginning of all things. And he's the righteous judge. And he'll judge all of us. And when he judges us, whether we were blind or we were blind, matters not. And so the challenge for every one of us here is this. Do not be deceived we need to realize where we really are. That's what Jesus says what he says. He says it so, so clearly. The church had deceived itself about its spiritual condition. And folks, every one of us, if we are not careful, will deceive ourselves and where our spiritual condition really is. You can come to church every time the doors are open and be lost. You can do good things and be lost. You can be a pastor and be lost. You can teach Sunday school and be lost. You can give more money than anybody and be lost. You can do good works and be lost. Jesus even says you can cast out demons and be lost. We cannot save ourselves. It's only the work of Jesus. And every one of us deserves hell. Please understand, every one of us deserves that. But then what does he say? Jesus says, I counsel you to buy for me gold refined by fire so that you may be rich and white garments so that you may clothe yourself and the shame of your nakedness may not be seen and salve to anoint your eyes so that you may see. And then 19, he says, those whom I love, I reprove and discipline so be zealous and repent. Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens his door, I will come into him and eat with him, and he with me. The one who conquers, I will grant him to sit with me on my throne, and I, as I also conquered and sat down with my father on his throne. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. Now here's one thing we need to see from this. 
is that these words that Jesus gives are the strongest words to any of the churches. You make me want to vomit, you're naked, you're blind, you're pitiable, you're wretched, you're all of these things. But you need to also see the heart behind why Jesus says what he says. What does he say? He calls them those whom I love. Don't miss that. The strongest words Jesus gives, the strongest words that Jesus gives to a church is also the one whom Jesus says, I love you. And so when Jesus calls us to repent and he calls us to trust and he calls us to obedience, he's doing that because he loves us, not because he condemns us. Because he's looking at the church who's been bought by the blood of Jesus that cannot lose their salvation. But he is also demanding that we be obedient. And so there's never a moment for any one of us where God says, I'm done with you. Until there's a moment where God says, I'm done with you. And until that moment comes, we need to fight for obedience. This picture here of Jesus outside, I want you to, and so many preachers have used this term, I think, think it with good heart, but this idea of Jesus standing and knocking, this is not an invitation for salvation. Who's Jesus talking to? The church. Where is Jesus? Outside. Knocking on the door trying to get in. That's a damning word for the church. That's not Jesus saying, if you'll just open up the door of your heart, I'll save you, although that's clearly biblical and he will. Jesus is looking at the church saying, I'm outside knocking, and you just won't open up. You just won't be obedient. You just won't do what you're supposed to do. You won't do right. You won't act right. You won't do the things that I'm telling you to do. Now, this is evangelistic in a way, absolutely, but the picture here is different. The picture here is of a loving father who is seeking a renewed relationship with children he has scolded. And the children are on the inside having a, just an insignificant meal of crusty bread. And the father's on the outside knocking, trying to get in because he wants to give them a feast. That's the picture. And folks, that's Jesus' invitation to every one of us this morning. We can have crusty bread, and we, we can be satisfied with table scraps, or we can be obedient to do what God's called us to do. But sometimes what it takes is for us to realize we're poor, we're blind, we're pitiable, we're wretched, and we're naked. And when we realize that, we'll open the door to the one who's got all that we need. We cannot save ourselves. Our church cannot save itself. We cannot save our families. We cannot save our country. We can't do much good on, apart from the work of Jesus. The question is, is how many of us are willing to open the door to let Jesus do what only he can do? Now, for some of you, the reason you're here is that you're cold. And what I mean by that is you've never made or you've never given your life to Jesus. Today is the day. Repent, put your faith and trust in Christ, and because Jesus loves you, he'll save you. But for some of us, we're in this lukewarm side. And folks, I'm not going to sugarcoat this because Jesus doesn't sugarcoat this. A lukewarm Christian is not a Christian. By definition. And if you're lukewarm, you think you're okay between the Lord, folks, I ask you again to read Scripture because he's the Amen. He's the firstborn of all creation, and he's the one that's the faithful and trustworthy witness. What he says is what matters. But for some of you, you're hot. Man, you're, you're, you're doing everything you can to be faithful. Keep it up, because Jesus sees our works. But folks, the good news this morning is this, is that Jesus loves us still. The worst church here in the seven churches is the church that says, I love you. And don't miss that. No matter how far we have fallen, Jesus loves us and wants our good. Folks, I just ask that we think about repenting on our own side. We're too busy looking at other people's sin. We're not easy enough to look at our own mirror. And the mirror of our heart says, Jesus looks at us and says, you're naked. 
you're cold, you're blind, you're pitiable, but I love you anyway. So if he loves us that much, let's repent and trust him. Whatever business God would have you to do this morning, I implore you to do it. Because there is a moment where Jesus says, I'm going to spew you out. And none of us want that. That's a bad judgment. And Jesus is the faithful, true witness, and he's able to do it. Let's pray. Lord, thank you for your word to us, your words to us. God, thank you for loving us, even when we don't deserve it, even when we're sinful, even, to be honest, we're a wreck. And God, some of us are a wreck. God, the problem is, is that we don't often know it. And God, I pray you would show us all where we need your grace in our life. You'd show us where we need our, your mercy in our life that you would draw us out of being cold and out of being lukewarm to be the warm, hot disciple you've called us to. Thank you for being the faithful and the true witness. Thank you for being obedient all the way to the point of death, God. And it's in your beautiful name we pray. Amen.